Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the uh, Berman Institute Noontime Seminar Series. <coughs> it's my pleasure today to um, introduce our guest. And, but before I do that, I want to acknowledge everyone that has helped us uh, invite uh, Professor Nissenbaum to campus. This seminar is a joint seminar between the Berman Institute and In Health which is one of the Signature University uh, initiatives, and Scott Signature directed it, and it's right, right there. So we thank uh, Scott for partnering with us in uh, this invitation to uh, Professor Nissenbaum. Also, this, uh, this seminar has the distinction, I think, of having a wider uh, array of co-sponsors from different parts of the university than we've ever had previously. We have one co-sponsor from Krieger School of Arts and Sciences, the Department of Philosophy is a co-sponsor. We have two from the Bloomberg School of Public Health, the Center for Population Health Information Technology, and the Department of Health Policy and Management. We have uh, two from the Whiting School, the Information Security Institute, and the Department of Computer Science are co-sponsoring, and also the Institute for Computational Medicine, which is a joint institute of the School of Medicine and the Whiting School. So, there's just a tad interest in uh, Dr. Professor Nissenbaum's presentation, and we're delighted to see so many colleagues from across the university involved. Really quickly, uh, Helen Nissenbaum is Professor of Media, Culture, Communication, and Computer Science at NYU, where she is also Director of the Information Law Institute. By background training, Professor Nissenbaum is a philosopher, her areas of expertise span social, ethical, and political impl implications of information technology and digital media. Her research publications have appeared in journals of philosophy, politics, law, media studies, information studies, and computer science. She's written and edited four books, uh, one of which is a very important book that I would commend to all of you, Privacy in Context, in Context Technology, Policy, and the Integrity of Social Life, which was published in 2010 by Stanford University Press. Her research, her scholarship, which is focused on privacy, trust online, and security, has been funded by, you can go down this long list, the NSF, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, the Ford Foundation, the Department of Homeland Security, and HHS, to name a few. It is really a great pl pleasure and privilege to invite Professor Nissenbaum to Hopkins. Please join me in welcome here to you. and thank you all for coming. Um, I, I wanted to mention that this is joint work. It's, this is based on an, a paper that has not yet appeared and uh, it is the first time I'm presenting it. But it's joint work with uh, Solon Barocas, who's a PhD um, student and hopefully soon not to be a PhD student <laughs> in our Department of Media, Culture and Communication and I'm really delighted to be here. Um, so, I, I want to talk mainly about anonymity and consent and what happens to anonymity and consent in the face of big data. Now, I'll do a little bit of background and setting up the landscape and then I'm going to dive into the arguments of uh, you know, discussing why big data does this end run because I think anybody who's been working in this area is already aware that anonymity and um, consent or informed consent or notice and consent, people use different words for it, um, are, are difficult. They're difficult to achieve and yet we consider them very important. Um, and in the case of big data, the area that I'm coming from is not so much the technology of big data and of course uh, this word has has become a buzzword. It seems you almost can't go a single day without somebody saying big data at you, and I've just made that day happen for you today. <laughs> but you know, in the news and on TV and oh, uh, the president and so forth, it's such a big term so that we feel forced to use it, even though every time I say big data, I always go big data because. Um, 
I'm not completely comfortable with it myself. Anyway, there are a number of us who have been working on areas of information technology and eth the ethical and social and political and legal issues associated with information technology and digital media. And this, this concern over the ethical and social and cultural and legal issues that uh, relate to big data um, are, is continuous with some of these issues that many of us have been working on. And as you heard, one of the areas that I've worked on a lot uh, is privacy and, and, and big data raises some really fascinating and difficult issues surrounding privacy. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about contextual integrity because um, I think that it offers a very useful framework for thinking about privacy. Um, but many people downplay the importance of privacy in relation to big data and they say, yeah, privacy is important, but there's so many other ethical issues, let's not stress too much about privacy. Let's rather focus on things like unfair discrimination and due process, which is a very fascinating one, um, uh, manipulation, autonomy, and so forth, harm, I mean direct informational harms. I, I feel that, in fact, many of these issues should be dealt with in relation to privacy because there's a way in which they follow from the fact that privacy is now vulnerable because of big data. So first, I'm going to do a little bit of setting the context, as I promised, and I want to just say what, how I'm thinking, how I use the word big data. I could go around the room and say, well, you know, what do you, when you hear big data, what do you mean? What do you, and so on. And I find that a lot of people have different ideas about what big data actually is, and therefore why some of the ethical and social and legal issues follow from big data. Now, you can see that big data as a field, if people who are working in it could be uh, um, in, the, in the scientific area, statistics, mathematics, in the technological, computer science, information science, and uh, so that to many, big data is a science, it's a matter of statistics, it's, it's a matter of having the databases that are big enough, it's a methodology, so that they're, they're all these things. Um, and sometimes you'll ask people who just simply say that big data is just a big database, which, which in some sense it is. But what I'm, what I, the way I'm going to use this term, and perhaps all of us, uh, it's, it's fairly plausible, is to think of it more as a paradigm. Big data has become a paradigm. It's a way of a way of thinking about the world. It's a way of achieving knowledge. We, we, can, we can do it through these means, through the means of big data. We now have a mode or a method of achieving knowledge. So it's, it's a knowledge framework. It's an epistemic framework. And it's also a way of making decisions. It's a, it's a decision-making paradigm and a knowledge um, development paradigm. And so that's how I'm going to be using big data in this talk, as a paradigm. But the, but the question we also want to ask when we think uh, at first now about why big data uh, raises privacy concerns, but we're not, we're not directly going to look at the problems of big data and, and privacy and why it uh, because that's going to be answered very uh, summarily, very quickly. But rather, we're going to think about why anonymity and consent, which have been two responses, two dominant responses to many of the privacy concerns that we've been confronting up until now, why those are now deeply problematic in the face of big data. So I, I want us to, uh, again, and I'll be thinking of privacy as contextual integrity, and this is the theory that I've written about, um, that I developed in the book Privacy in Context, and then for many papers that followed, I've tried to show how we can actually apply uh, privacy as contextual integrity in many of the areas, uh, and I continue to do some of that work, looking at posting court records online in the health 
arena and uh, so on. But this, the concept of privacy as contextual integrity has a few fundamental theses. I'm going to go very quickly through it because it's quite important as we move along the argument. First of all, what this theory says is privacy is not, it disagrees with the idea of privacy as control over information about ourselves, but rather it claims that when we care about privacy, when we feel our privacy has been threatened, it's because we think that personal information has flowed inappropriately. We welcome the flow of information, it's good to share, and yet we feel that our privacy is violated when this information is shared inappropriately. And that's the fundamental interest in privacy, which is appropriate flow of information. And the theory then goes on to give an account of what appropriate flow of information is. And it says it's flow that's in conformance with contextual, that is context-based or context-specific informational norms. And these norms are expressed as a function of actors, information types, and transmission principles, which says that, the, so, um, the claim is that when people think about information flow, we think about who the information is about, acting in what capacity, from whom is it being transmitted, sometimes it's the information subject him or herself, and to whom it is going. So maybe you have a student in a, in a high school, and the teacher is transmitting information to the parent. So that's a flow of information. Then you have information type. What, what type of information is the teacher sharing to the parent? Maybe in this case it would be the grades. Maybe it's uh, behavior issues that, that are happening in the classroom. And then transmission principle is, a, is a, it's just a jargon term that comes from a theory which says what are the constraints or what are the terms under which this information flows. Now one of the most important ones is control. So we share information voluntarily, but that is not the only transmission principle that's possible. Sometimes you're forced to share information. So in, on April 15th, when we, when we submit our IRS uh, to the IRS the tax forms, we, we don't have a choice. We, we have their questions. We, we have to give certain answers. And so we're compelled to provide the information. Sometimes the information is bought from one party to the other about a third party. So the tr transmission principle is just the constraint under which the information flows. And then finally, the ethical part of the theory um, argues that because often, I mean, the, the nature of society and the nature of technology is a disruption of information flows from time to time, and we, we don't want to resist all change but we want to have a mechanism to evaluate change. And so this, but nevertheless, this theory is somewhat conservative because it says that when you have a disruption of flow, then the red flag is raised. And you, and you ask, you need to go through a certain kind of analysis which the theory describes. You evaluate the, sta the various, say, stakeholder interests as well as the general and uh, ethical and political values. So you may say things like, if we have this disruption of information flow as a result of court records being placed on a, the open web, what happens to certain values that are at stake when we do that? So, for example, you might say, well, openness of just open justice is promoted because now anybody can go to the web. And then you might step back and say, hey, wait a second, because we have this idea of expungement of a record under certain conditions, and when you place something on the web, a person's record is there forever. And so certain kinds of values that we have that are embodied in certain protocols that we have in society are now violated by new informational practices, and we need to do an analysis of whether we can sustain these general ethical and political values even as the disruptions occur. And um, importantly, and quite specific to this theory, is the idea that contexts have their own sets of ends, purposes, and values, and, and I'm assuming that most of you sitting here are from the healthcare 
context, what I would call the healthcare context, and the healthcare context has its own internal values, ends, and purposes, so that if someone comes for treatment, the ideal is that the doctor doesn't say, how much do you earn, but rather you treat everybody equally. Whereas if you go and want to buy a Mercedes Benz and you say, but I'm sorry, I only have $100, the dealer says, well, that's tough luck. So there's certain values that are inherent in one context that are not in other contexts, and sometimes information flow supports. And that's why the term integrity comes into the picture, because it's the integrity of the social context that the appropriate information flow serves, not only the interests of the information subject, and that's a very important part of the theory. So this is, these are just some slides that I've pulled in because they're, I don't know, nicer than the other ones. Um, and so it's just to review some of what I've already said. Um, the, the first part just talks about the theories that this, this, that, that this differs from. This is what a, a context, this is the structure of these context-specific informational norms. And I've worked with some computer scientists who have actually um, implemented these, the structure of these norms in certain um, access rules to databases. And it's promising um, in some of the work that I've done uh, with Abby Rubin, who's here but not here today, um, in the context of a Sharps grant, we've looked at access to medical records using these kinds of structured <coughs> so that's how I'm understanding privacy in this talk. Here are just some, um, some fleshed out examples of informational norms. Okay, so, so but, the, but this is the part we want to get to and then move on to big data, is that um, when we talk about respecting privacy, where we say respecting appropriate flows of information, it means we are respecting these entrenched context-specific informational norms. And when you have something threaten these norms, and often, because my interest in privacy is really rooted in, not so much in the concept and the ethics of privacy, but it's really rooted in technology and in information technology and digital media, I'm really interested in the disruptions of flow that come from technology, from digital media. Privacy is threatened by the disruption of these context-specific informational flows. Now, when you, when, you, um, when you want to turn this into a heuristic and you see that here's big data, this paradigm, and there's certain activities that are part of big data, what we need to do is um, we locate the nature and source of the disruption, and then we evaluate the disruption to see whether it's problematic or legitimate. And sometimes a disruptive flow is perfectly acceptable because it promotes certain ends so much better. And I think healthcare is one of those arenas where these, what we would call disruption, these disruptive flows, promote health, public health, individual health in ways that are very uh, are positive. And so we embrace those changes when that happens. Now, okay, so I jumped right, there's no intermediate <coughs> slide here, but the idea here is that when you have big data, there's tremendous disruption of information flow. And so in, immediately you know that they're going, it's going to raise privacy problems all over. And we look to some of the mechanisms, and now we get to the heart of the talk, that have been very popular <coughs> in preserving privacy in other arenas. And the arena, for example, that I've worked on a lot um, of, uh, raise, uh, of the, uh, is, the, is online, and looking specifically at, say, um, um, notice and choice, or transparency and choice, the idea that you <coughs> develop a lot of, you have a privacy policy, people arrive at a website, there's the privacy policy, that constitutes the notice, and then consent is, uh, if you 
you know, both notice and consent or informed consent are highly problematic in the online arena because do you opt in, do you opt out, what does it mean to say you've consented, and of course uh, they're very, they're, there's great difficulty with um, the informed part as well. So why have anonymity and informed consent been extremely um, popular and important? And again, I really <coughs> look forward to a conversation with you about these parallel um, uses of anonymity and consent in the biomedical research and biomedic and treatment and popular uh, public health um, as well, population health as well. Why are these mechanisms so dominant? And I'm going to just give our perhaps somewhat superficial answer. One is that. As you can see, anonymity severs this, the link between identity and this and the other information. And what it does is, it kind of it just removes the data outside of the realm of privacy. It says these privacy issues are too difficult. We just you know cross off the identifying information. All these privacy rules that we have, way back to 19. 73, when a report was written by the Department of Health and Human Services about uh, fair information practice principles, the information was treated in two ways. There was the de-identified and then there was the identified. And the, the, all the privacy interest focuses on the identified information. So when you, when you uh, achieve <coughs> anonymization, then you sever this link and you're home free. The second one, the, the answer with regard to informed consent is, well, in those cases that you're not able to do it, and of course in many cases it's not that it's because it's hard to do, but it just doesn't make sense to deal with the information anonymously. Informed consent is important because it says that these privacy choices are actually <coughs> personal choices. You need to let people make these choices. Privacy, and I think it is rooted, I mean this is my, I say I think it's, it's in my view, it's popular because it's rooted in this idea of control over information about yourself, that privacy is control over information about yourself, particularly about personal or sensitive information. So informed consent respects the subject's control and the right to choose. And that's why it's been so popular, especially in a capitalistic <coughs> society where we think there's a marketplace, and when you engage, particularly in the commercial arena, you have all these choices. You, you can buy uh, uh, fat-free mayonnaise, or real mayonnaise, or, or mayonnaise with honey in it. I mean, you, we have all these choices, and we can choose what people do with our data. So choice is really fundamental to our engagement in society. Now, what I want to do now is look at what the problems are that big data poses and acknowledge that a lot of these problems with anonymity and consent, the challenges to anonymity and <coughs> consent, and now I'm going to first talk about anonymity and then I'm going to talk about consent, have been around for a long time. And some of them are very practical, of a very practical nature. Some of them are more philosophically intriguing, and um, maybe I'm going to stay at some of these, but anybody who's been in the business for a while is going to be familiar with what I say. One kind of challenge to anonymity is that it's just, it's hard to achieve in a world of a lot of data, be it big data or not. In a world of information technology, in a world of the internet, and Google searches, and, and all those things that are very familiar to us. Um, but two in particular, I want to say that we can deduce uh, um, the, the, the entities that we, <coughs> that we function with, that we interact with, can deduce information, can deduce identifying information from us, even when a good faith effort has been made. And many of us remember the case of the AOL database where AOL wanted to grant access to search queries, which was actually for beneficial purposes, and said, well, here you go, and we've crossed out all the identifiers, and then, of course, 
There was things like vanity searches, and there were ways to pull back a lot of the identifying information. And of course, there's triangulation. Uh, you tell me this, I, I cross-check with another database, or you know your address, and your profession, and where your kids go to school, and all of a sudden, I'm able to identify you. I'm a, so this, this is a challenge. And um, there are these re-identification attacks that uh, were made famous, Nar Narayanan and Schmatikov, Cynthia <coughs> Cork, uh, Latonya Sweeney, and I'm sure many others, um, database matching, uh, linkage through query attacks. So, you know, you have a database and you let someone ask various, you know, many, many questions, and then eventually with, with the answers they get back, they're, they're able to identify, re-identify some of the people, some of the fields, um, attach identification to some of the fields in the database. Now you may, um, um, you may say this is, this is a problem because I, anonymity serves some very important societal <laughs> functions. And so it's in a, an old paper actually that uh, published many years ago before, what's, what's the phrase, before big data was a twinkle in anybody's eye. Um, <laughs> It was, what, what is the value of anonymity in an information age? What is anonymity? Well, you could say that it's uh, namelessness. That's the classic definition. But what I wanted to argue in that paper was that because, a net, because you can achieve many of the um, problematic results, let's just use that generally, without knowing someone's name, Maybe we want to um, say that the, the value of anonymity in an information age is not namelessness, but it's about reachability. And so we, here are all the reasons that we care about anonymity, that, uh, and these are classic sorts of reasons that people have given in the literature. You can act and speak without reprisal. They offer um, the protective cloak for people with certain um, um, stigmatized illnesses or, or um, for children or needy people, uh, freedom from commercial reach, sometimes you don't want to be called, uh, it supports whistleblowing, uh, and I say unwarranted entrepreneurship, freedom to study, develop moral autonomy, <coughs> because, um, because I was very interested, for, and still am, but at the time, uh, talked a lot about privacy in the context of web search to say that for me it was problematic and still is that the web search providers keep a detailed track of what we search online and now even more so are linking that information with information about like take something like Google linking that information with all the other information collected um, under its umbrella of under all of the Google services, and for many, many years they said, well, you know, search is special, search is different, we're keeping it separate from everything else, and all of a sudden we have the federated privacy rules. But anyway, the, the claim here is that in certain things that we do, of course answerability is important, and we don't want a society that lacks accountability where, where we should have accountability, but in, in things like education and research, we want people to act freely um, without and not hold them to account. So, given that, what are let's 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 now just say to ourselves: Let's assume we can achieve anonymity. Let's assume we've solved the problems that Narayanan and Schmadikov and Sweeney and Bork are concerned with. Let's assume we can achieve the separation of data from what we think of as personally identifiable data, like social security, now, uniquely identifiable data. Let's assume that, and now let's think about these end run. Why does big data still pose a problem, and I'm calling it end run around anonymity? And so now we come to a whole bunch of different kinds of challenges um, that, um, that I want to draw your attention to. So we're in this world now that we're saying even if 
anonymity in this more classic sense could be achieved, what are some of the challenges? And there are four of them, um, two on each of these slides. So the one is um, comprehensiveness. The fact that so, what, what, so let's think about big data for a, a second, because I haven't gone through this little, <laughs> this with you, which is um, the, 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 what big data, um, it's an aggregation of, of activities, and often everything happens, which is, first of all, a lot of data is collected. And the data can be collected in many ways. One of the novel ways is through tracking and um, um, ubiquitous sensing of our activities. It could be something like um, your smart grid, the smart grid uh, utilities meter that you have in your home that's now collecting information in this automated way, or it could be you filling out a form, but it's the collecting of the information. It's the aggregating of massive amounts of information from many different sources. So each of these is not necessarily in itself distinctive, but we, can, we now have the technology to um, gather a lot of data. Um, and then there's the analytics part of it. We, can, we have the science and technology and the statistics to analyze this data and put out profiles and mine the data and uh, do predictive analytics and perform all, all those activities with these massive databases. And so uh, obviously we have um, disruption and um, 100 data points if, if you have, you don't know my name, but you have a hundred data points about me in this digital environment, and if that affects how I'm treated by a, a party, a company, and so on, um, this is um, this is Joe Turo, who, as some of you may know, at the University of Pennsylvania, um, his question is, what's the difference if they know my name or not? So here we are, we've achieved anonymity. Nobody can put back the name, but if they know that you are identified with 100 data points, what difference does it make if you're anonymous or not? Then there's this bizarre notion of an anonymous identifier. And I picked this up recently. I put EG Ad ID because, because Google was announcing a few months ago that um, we're no longer going to collect personally identifying, uh, uniquely identifying information, we're going to start this thing called Ad ID, and it's very privacy protective because we're, go we're going to make a completely meaningless identifier which we're going to attach to everybody's records. So we didn't think that this was such a great thing because here, and here's the reason, and here's, here's something that was uh, written about Facebook. So Facebook also claims to be very um, <coughs> careful with its, its users' information. A website uses a form formula to turn its users, you know, scramble the user's email address into a jumbled string of numbers and letters. An advertiser does the same. Both send their jumbled list to a third party that looks for matches. When the two match, the website can show an ad targeted to a specific person even though no, no I, personally identifying information has been exchanged. So you could say, ah, oh, this is great, it's all anonymous, and you want to question this idea of a so-called anonymous identifier, which defies our normal conception of anonymity. Now here was a quote um, from someone uh, from Google, we don't want the name. The name is noise. In fact, the inferences we, the, the information we need about individuals is not the personally identi uniquely identifying information, but it's all these other fields of information about you. What do you search? Where did you go on holiday? How much electricity did you use? Uh, what medication do you have? And so forth. And this is the information that's rich for uh, predictive modeling. This is the useful information from which sensitive, let's say, I think uh, all of us know about the target case, presumably sensitive information can be inferred. So once again, you, 
this is, we've achieved anonymity, but we have this problem. And then finally, research that's underwritten by anonymity. If you conduct a, a study, <coughs> a specific study, discovered depressive symptoms from, pass, uh, from passive unobtrusive internet usage monitoring, there was a correlation between certain, passive, uh, certain patterns of internet usage and depression in students. Now, you, the researcher, go to your IRB and you say, this is going to be conducted completely anonymously. You do your study, you respect the anonymity of the students, you publish your results. That's at University A. Now, University B says, oh, this is brilliant, takes the result, and now can identify the supposedly depressive student in University B, because we have that information. So it's here you're under the cloak of anonymity. This allows you to reveal information that where you can identify the people that have this particular condition. So the, the conclusion of this section is that even if what you do can achieve namelessness, you're losing the underlying values. And I'll come back to that right at the end. So now let's look at informed consent. This is some of the arguments, this is you know the pre-big data that, that many of us have uh, been working on. I in the paper in Devilis, uh, in, in a lot in the book, it hasn't worked, people don't understand the notice, it's poorly implemented, of course there's been some, a lot of good work on um, the, the, use, the user experience side of things, uh, and something that I've suggested called the transparency paradox because the Federal Trade Commission and, and, and many other parties are saying, look, these, they're so abstrusely written, these privacy policies, we need to reduce, we need to simplify, it has to look like a nutrition label, then people will be able to understand. And my pushback is, yes, you can do all that, but then you're going to leave out everything that's important to making the decision. And now, how many people use Facebook? And, um, I mean, I don't blame you. <laughs> I don't. How many people, and I bet you there's some of you who've read, you've read Facebook, the Facebook privacy policy. I, I'm not going to ask you for a show. But I'm going to assume in this audience that many people have. So I will ask you this question. If you post the photograph on Facebook, even if you have a setting that says you don't want them to perform facial recognition on your photographs, can Facebook use the photographs you've posted to improve its facial recognition technology? Sure. Uh, yes. You, 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 you know to be so, which is great. And other people who may have read it, I, I don't know what the answer, I actually don't really know what the answer is, but thank you. So, by the way, yes, they can. But here we are, we're very educated people, we've read, and Facebook has one of the, has a very well written privacy policy, but there's just, if you want to make it simple, there's just, it's just not that much you can put into it, like this fat here. And then, you know, other things that if you go through life, every time you have reinteraction, there's a privacy policy. <clears throat> Each time you have to make this, engage in this agreement. Um, and then, actually, when I was giving this talk at the New York Times, this talk, <clears throat> not this talk, the poor um, general counsel there said that they suffer because they use these ad networks and they don't know what the ad network's privacy policies are. And so they post a privacy <coughs> policy on the New York Times and they're all these, um, what, they, what she thought were kind of bottom-feeding law companies who'll, who'll find some tiny little inconsistency between what you're saying in your privacy policy and, what, and the practice that you or the ad network that you have no control over is doing, and then they sue you. And so it's a very difficult situation with uh, notice and consent. Now, there's some, there's some um, challenges that are magnified by big data, and not big data per se, but all this whole, this whole paradigm. And that is that 
what contextual integrity wants and wants to ask you, you need to know who are the actors, who's getting the information. And with, with the, the practice of aggregating and having information flow from party to party, you might have a Fitbit, you know that, fit, that this information goes up to the Fitbit server, who does it go to? Does it go to your medical insurance company? You know, CVS was encouraging its employee, employees to get Fitbit and a reduction in uh, medical insurance premiums. So how does that information flow? Is it going to the NSA? Obviously, it's going to Axel because everything seems to. So it just blows this out of the water. The idea that anybody could actually track the flow of information from party to party. Then what information are we talking about? Because we're giving certain kinds of information in this party-to-party -party arrangement, but then there's all this information that gets inferred. So what information is at issue? What information are we talking about? The information that's given, the information that's inferred? And under what constraints? The issues are so complex with ad networks, who gets the information? Does Facebook actually share its information with third parties? So these are just some of the previous um, challenges that have now been magnified by big data. But these are the end run. There are just two end run issues with consent having to do with big data that emerge from big data. So let's assume we've solved all those other problems like with the case of anonymity. Assume we can do it. We can inform, people can read, they can understand, we can map out the flow of information from party to party. Here's the end run. One is that even if you either consent or don't consent to information about yourself being shared with certain parties, it doesn't actually matter. Because a lot can be inferred about you through your explicit associations. And some of you are, I'm sure, familiar with this GADAR, you know, the, the, the system that um, was, was developed at MIT, which could tell to a high percentage um, whether you were gay or not, simply based on your network of friends on Facebook. So uh, it was called GADAR. And it, it, it can be, so these are the people that you explicitly associate. It could be the, your high school class. So you have these explicit associations. This one is also another one of these major concerns, which, and, and this happened to me when I was, I was contacted by Verizon, who said, you know, would you like to participate in... Um, it's, it's really beneficial to you because you're only going to get ads that you really want. But we want to be able to track where you are by your postal code and so forth. And please give us permission to do that. So they were you know, being very, very good. And as I'm hitting yes or no, I'm realizing, in fact, if enough people do it, they don't need me to do it because they can infer, they already have so much information about me as a customer, that whether or not I consent to this little bit of information that they're asking me to share, they can already profile me quite accurately. And this is our concern over the tyranny of the <coughs> minority. The inference from a representative sample, which says that the value of any individual person's consent is actually very, no very low, Multiple attributes can be inferred globally when as few as 20% of the users reveal their attribute information. So, in fact, the conclusion here is that in many of these instances, it's not that consent can be gotten, that people don't understand, but even if those things work out, consent actually becomes irrelevant as long as they're enough people, a small minority of people, who are willing to share information. And we know that uh, at this point there are. So that's, that's, how, that's the conclusion, similar to the one that we saw in the 
anonymity. So now, some people would say, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to probably go over for another five minutes. So what do, we, what do we say once we arrive at this? Some people will just say, and have said in writing, well, privacy is overrated. Let's forget about it. Just make the trade-off. Obviously, big data, there's benefits, there's costs, uh, there's, 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 uh, there's greater benefits than costs, privacy is a fool, fool's errand, just give it up. I, I don't think this is the case, obviously. But here's a lesson, I think, and again, I'm, I'm really eager to hear from you, which is from reading O'Neill and Manson's book, Redefining Rule <coughs> Consent in Bioethics. Um, that what has happened in the privacy arena is that it takes every kind of arrangement between the data operator and the individual as if it's happening in a vacuum and every part of that relationship has to be inserted in the notice, in the agreement, in that information that's being provided to you that you need to consent to. But in what uh, O'Neill and Manson are arguing is that for the most part in biomedical ethics or in, in medical ethics, sorry, in the medical or biomed biomedical research arena, there are expectations that people come, come to, come in with, uh, the subjects or, or the patients, and there are a set of assumptions, general ethical assumptions. I'm coming in here, I know you're not going to kill me. I know you're not going to torture me. I know you're, uh, let's say, you're a physician, so you have certain expertise. You, you've sworn certain oath. So this, the informed consent moment, is asking for a, for a waiver, and it's a very specific waiver. It's a waiver of some of these expectations, but the expectations already are filled out in the background. And the waiver itself is for specific and legitimate purposes. Oops. Okay. It's quick. And so the the when someone in research is providing um, and, and I'm saying this with some trepidation because I hope this is correct, there, there are a set of assumptions that the subject can make, but you need to, as the researcher, explain in what ways you're departing from these expectations, and then you need to explain to the subject or the patient why they have good reason to still participate in this study or undergo a particular treatment. Either it's very good for it may be very good for you. I can't guarantee in the same way as I would guarantee if, if this were not a research treatment what the outcomes are because we don't completely know the risk. But these are the potential benefits. Or you may not be benefited, but someone else could be benefited tremendously by your participation. Or society at large could be tremendously benefited by your participation in the study and the risks aren't so great and so forth. So there's a very specific performance or practice that takes place in this exchange. So coming back now to the big data, the, the problem that what's happening here is that when people look at consent and transparency, uh, sorry, consent and anonymity and see what the problems are, the tendency is to say, ah, you see, we can't make privacy work. And the, our argument back is to say you're mistaking the means for the ends. It is true that anonymity and informed consent cannot achieve the ends that they were intended for any longer. So we cannot hang all our hopes on anonymity and consent. We can get a lot out of them still, but not what we thought. What we need to do is contextualize consent in the same way that we hope in the idealized biomedical case, in, in the idealized um, arrangement in the biomedical research and treatment. Explicate risk and benefit and its distribution, which is often completely ignored. Uh, because there's a lot of talk about minimizing risk through big data, 
but we don't talk about whose risks and whose benefits are at stake. We need to explicate explicitly and substantively what interests, rights, and obligations are at stake. And the data operators must give good reason in terms of interests, ethical, and political, and contextual values. And so you, it, it's not that you need to get the consent of the data subject, but the data operator, in order to do what they're doing, needs to make the argument for us, society, that they should be allowed to do it because there are substantive, positive interests, values, and contextual values that are served by doing it. And this doesn't happen because it's still the case that we're hanging everything onto the consent moment and making the individual make a choice, which A, that we're not able to do, and B, in many cases, doesn't matter whether we consent or not. Thanks. We have time for a few questions. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the prospects for ultimately having a better system than, uh, in this country uh, than the Social Security number for maintaining privacy and authentication? I'm assuming that most of us agree that using the Social Security number is kind of a right. efficient system. Yes, I mean, it's, it's I, I, are you asking the factual question of whether there is going to be something? Or in, in principle, I agree, and, and what's happened obviously with Social Security is um, it, it's, it's one of these network effect uh, situations where the more it's used, the more valuable it gets, and it becomes this unique identifier, the universal unique identifier. That, so, I don't know. Um, if you go back and read the re this report that I mentioned that for the first time um, outlines fair information practice principles, in that document, in 1973, they're talking about the social security number, and they're warning about the, the fact that it started out for this one little purpose only, and now has expanded all into these other. And so it's a little bit, um, I don't know, naive to think that we're going to get away um, from something like that, although I think it's worth trying. Of course, biometrics are rearing their heads and maybe will become that, the replacement. But we know what we're supposed to do. We know what we're supposed to do. Yeah. I serve in a, in a, a regulatory compliance capacity in the School of Medicine. And what I get to do it, uh, from time to time, unfortunately, is audit investigators who have lost their laptops, so they've had uh, other sorts of uh, data issues, confidentiality breaches, and so forth. And <clears throat> The, the thing about big data that concerns me a little bit is, and that, granted, this is from my naive sort of technophobic appreciation of what big data is all about, um, is at the front end of this. You know, the question I have to ask that investigator is that, why did you keep that information? And why was it kept here? And why is it being retained in this way? Who sees it? And I never get good answers to those questions. Um, one of the things that I think is sort of typical is that, well, you know, I, I got as much as I, I needed to get, or, I, or who knows what sort of associations and correlations I can find, but just you know, cast this big net. In the meantime, there's still the security and, and other issues that, that rear their heads too when these things go awry and these, this information gets breached. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've raised a lot of different points that are extremely vexing, and, and <clears throat> this is what we're pushing back against, this, this question of who knows, because when you collect the information, you may not know all of its value up front. And that's the same argument that Google gives when it records all the information. The way I like to deal with it a little bit, it doesn't solve your problem. Though I'm pleased to hear that you push. No, it's, it's good that you push back. But I see it a little bit as risk, you know, because we're, we're living, we're in this, um, we recognize that there's risk. And when someone hoards information, that increases risk. 
And I want us, as society or as institution, to say, what if, who's going to bear the risk if something goes bad? And I think we see in society often the way we set our institutions up is, is precisely to decide who's going to bear the risk. And I think the best example that's intuitive is the way the credit card companies bear the risk if your credit card is lost and someone runs up a bill. And so you, as an individual auditor, should push your um, researchers to say, what's this for? But also, you know, the larger institutional structure should, should be thinking about the allocation of risk if things go wrong. And I think that would push people to be very careful about what they keep. in itself is counter to the norms that we lived with for many years, thousands of years. So there's already a problem, um, although not always a problem. But again, I, want, I always want to keep back, come back to even in the medical arena in ways that we're able to track vital signs and so on and say, and, and why the use of wireless uh, conveyances of information, pacemakers and so on. Those are all disruptions, but ones that are beneficial, and it's fairly easy to go through the reasoning to arrive at that. The aggregation of records is also massively disruptive because um, it violates that flow of information that we're familiar with, particularly as the information that is collected in one context according to a certain set of norms as it flows is flowing in violation of those very context-specific norms. And so it's, um, it's highly problematic. And it requires that we do some of the auditing of those flows. So I, I agree. When I, when I use the word paradigm, I'm mainly, I'm mainly saying that it's a paradigm for, um, it's a knowledge paradigm. Just the acceptance of statistical these statistical truths, like the cluster, the clustering, and then um, arriving at the knowledge that, you know, the famous one that I'm sure we're all familiar with, that uh, there's a correlation between purchasing diapers and beer. And so we treat that as knowledge. And of course, then it's kind of the natural human instinct to say, why? What is, what's the source of the correlation? But the big data paradigm says, we don't care what the source of that is. That's a fact, and we're going to build from there. And we're going to make decisions based on that. So that's what I meant by a paradigm. Yeah. So in your book, in the beginning, one of the more helpful notions I found was this idea of a socio-technical system. Yes. Um, a technological system that's also very social and, and to under decisions embedded in how it's designed, but it's been made by someone somehow. Right. And I think the biotechs that's a little bit, or at least to me, new, thinking about how we would incorporate people's values and, and perspectives into the design of systems like that when there's such a technical literacy problem or the transparency issue and you can't really necessarily discern all of the decisions. And so I wonder, I mean, what's your answer to how we might handle that? So give me an example of, of a case that would emerge in the biomedical sciences. So that like the design of an electronic health record and just, you know, rules for uh, decision support or how, you know, what you might be able to prescribe or what patients might be able to access with respect to their health record or their test results. 
a lot of decisions go into those rules, but they're not really feasible for me. Right. I mean, there are a number of issues that are raised. One is to say, when you when you look at the, the idea of that socio-technical system is to recognize that if you look at some device, it's often the social issues or the privacy issues that emerge from it are not from this device itself, but rather from the way it functions in the larger socio-technical system. Not, not to, it's a very jargonish term in certain areas, but it's also very commonsensical and intuitive. That piece of metal and plastic that is my iPhone has none of the properties we attribute it to, attribute to it unless, until we take into consideration um, the way it functions within the larger system. And even that system has to be understood in, in economic and scientific and all those different senses. So when you're thinking about that database, for example, the electronic health record, it's, you must think of it in the larger system. And that should inform the kinds of rules and, and how it, the implications it has for the various roles of the people who function within the institution within which that electronic health record sits. So I truly hate to do this, but we promise everyone we're done at 1.15, so please join me again. Thank you. Very much.